Unfortunately, we have run out of time for debate and questions, so we will now be introducing our members for member statements. I recognize the member for Elgin, Middlesex, London. Thank you, Speaker. On Friday, October 2, 2020, Cindy Devine was killed at the young age of 35 in a two-vehicle accident. She was a wife to Richard and a mother of four. Richard's here today. Cindy was alive shortly after the crash, but she was completely entrapped in the car and could not escape. Unfortunately, Cindy died after her vehicle caught on fire. This tragic incident and accident was a result in a campaign now called Extinguishers for Cindy, and they are calling for Cindy's law to be established in this province. The Extinguishers for Cindy campaign has now raised over 45000 in the past three years. Speaker, this campaign has a lot of well-deserved support and momentum in my riding of Elgin, Middlesex, London. In addition to the money that the campaign has raised, Extinguishers for Cindy has also handed out approximately 1,000 fire extinguishers to local residents. Speaker, this is a friendly and impassioned reminder to all members of this House and those watching from home. Fire extinguishers are not only important to keep in our homes, but they should also be kept in our vehicles. Fire extinguishers save lives. Keep up the good work, Richard and team. Thank you, Speaker. Thank you. Member statements. The member for Nickel Belt. Thank you, Speaker. Today, December 1st, is AIDS Day. One of the most important messages that AIDS taught us is the importance of protecting our blood supply. In the 80s, AIDS in our blood supply unknowingly infected hundreds of Canadians we, who needed blood transfusion, leading to the Royal Commission of Inquiry on the Blood System in Canada, better known as the Crever Inquiry, which concluded, and I quote, that blood is a public resource, that donors should not be paid, that Canada must increase self-sufficiency in all blood and blood products, and that no part of the national blood operator's duty should be contracted out. In 2014, a private company was prepared to open paid plasma collection centre in Toronto and Hamilton. Recognizing the threat, the government passed the Voluntary Blood Donation Act. I was proud to vote in favour of that bill along with the current Minister of Health, Minister Jones, and eight members of the current government to shut these clinics down. Now, eight years later, Canadian Blood Services has signed a deal with Griffel Pharmaceutical in order to contract out plasma clinician to that for-profit collector. We must remember the Canadians, the Ontarians who became sick, who died. We must remember the lessons of the past and respect the Crever inquiry. The Ontario Minister of Health is the lead supervisor of the Canadian Blood Services. She has a duty to act right now to protect Ontarians and Canadians by shutting down this deal. Thank you, Speaker. Thank you. Member Statements. The member for Lanark, Frontenac, Kingston. Thank you, Speaker. I want to talk today about the launch of an exciting idea and acknowledging the good work of our Minister of Colleges and Universities and our Minister of Education to support our young people to explore and find a rewarding career. Speaker, this is a good news story, from the recognition of missed career opportunities for a new generation to the rollout of the dual credit secondary school program, supporting the needs of a dynamic and changing workforce. This is an idea with wings. When news of an additional $4.8 million in program funding reached the secondary schools of Lanark, Frontenac, Kingston, the reaction was overwhelmingly positive. Smith Falls District Collegiate Institute Principal Terry Gardner said, the dual credit program represents an outstanding opportunity for students entering trades or trying a course in their area of interest. It allows them opportunity to try on college and many students see that they can be successful. Janet Sanderson, principal of Granite Ridge Education Centre in Charbot Lake, said it gives our students a chance to get a taste of college life, explore post-secondary options, and test the waters. One student remarked, the dual credits program gives him a reason to like school again. 
Speaker, with one in three tradespeople over the age of 55, the infrastructure of our future will be built by the next generation. Experiential learning is an invitation to explore pathways to robotics, electronics, carpentry, healthcare, mechanics, and more, all under the guidance and mentorship of skilled trades, teachers, college partners, and industry professionals. Ontario's dual credit program has created a buzz in Lanark, Frontenac, Kingston, and it's powered by the purest form of clean energy, the curiosity and inventiveness of our youth. Member statements, member for Ottawa Centre. Thank you, Speaker. A loud thud was heard yesterday across Ontario at 11 a.m. Speaker. It was the dropping and the introduction of the Ottawa Light Rail Transit Commission report. It was a 650-page-plus document, Speaker, detailing the problems we've had with our LRT system. It was something I have fought for in this place, thanks to residents and community members back home who I want to thank for their work. But you know, sometimes, Speaker, the truth hurts. And it certainly hurts this morning for advocates of public-private partnerships and infrastructure. Because Justice William Horrigan, who led this report, said the following, quote, the P3 model caused or contributed to several of the ongoing difficulties in this project. The city traditionally had a hands-on role dealing with projects. Given the lesser role it played in this particular mode, it was left in a position where it had limited insight or control over the project." End of quote. Speaker, P3s are an accident waiting to happen. They will not offer the transparency the public deserves. That is the lesson, I believe, from Ottawa's LRT failure. But right now, as I speak, the same P3 consultant speaker, the same P3 contractors that made a mess out of Ottawa's LRT are building the Eglinton Crosstown. So I call on this government to read Justice Horrigan's report, to learn the lessons, not waste the public money, and make sure the mess that happened in Ottawa never happens again. Member statements. Member for Stormont, Dundas, South Glengarry. Thank you, Speaker. For 10 years, the United Way sponsored aid of Stormont, Dundas, and Glengarry has been kicking off the festive season with their annual holiday gala. This past weekend at the gala, Karen and Ray Brunet were recognized with the Andre Mayo Award, which is the United Way's <coughs> highest honor, volunteer honor. Although this award was announced at their AGM in early June, the United Way Canada representatives attended the annual gala to present the award to Karen and Ray in person. With this being the 10th year of them being the chair of the gala, the timing couldn't be any better. The award honours a volunteer who has demonstrated a lifelong commitment to community, philanthropy and the United Way movement. The individual is recognized by his or her, by his or her peers as exemplifying the United Way values of leadership, volunteerism, inclusive inclusivity, community engagement, commitment, and respect. Karen and Ray were selected from among nominations that came from many of the 69 United Ways across Canada. Karen and Ray have put in over 5,000 hours of volunteering into my local United Way and can be linked to the majority of sponsors and donations that this event receives. And they, are therefore, and they, there, and they therefore ensure the event's success year after year. It is not an exaggeration to say that it is truly thanks to their selfless dedication and community connections that this event has raised over half a million dollars in 10 years that it has existed. Thank you very much. Member statements, the member for Humber River, Black Creek. Thank you, Speaker. The holiday season is upon us, a time of kindness and goodwill toward all. During this time, many groups, associations, places of worship, and more organize important acts of charity, but sometimes a single person or family steps up to do something remarkable. These acts of joy and kindness and charity come in many different forms and each with their own story of inspiration. The Desario family were inspired by the care their daughter received at Sick Kids Hospital for juvenile diabetes. So in 1999, they began a yearly tradition of decorating their home with Christmas lights to raise money for sick kids. 
And when I say decorate, I mean over-the-top beautiful with tens of thousands of lights, probably visible from space and every other decoration you can imagine. It's a wonderful site that captures the hearts of all ages, and this year they're hoping to raise $20,000. Speaker, as you know, the Hospital for Sick Kids is known as a place of legends where every one of their patients has a legendary story that inspires us all. It is also home to the largest hospital-based child health care research institute in Canada, and we're so proud and fortunate that it is located here in Ontario. Speaker, the Desario Family Festival of Lights begins this Saturday, December 3rd at 5 p.m. at their home at 165 Benjamin Boak Trail in the Keelan Shepherd area in Toronto's northwest end. It runs until the end of this year, and I thank them for their hard work to spread joy and help children in need. So whether you happen to be in the area or not, I encourage you to come by and view the site for yourself, and perhaps that visit may become a family tradition for you as well. Happy holidays. Yay. Thank you. Oh. Member Statements, the member for Mississauga Centre. Speaker, good morning. It is an honour to stand in the House today to mark an important anniversary that Romanians all around the world celebrate. Every year on December 1st, Romanians come together to celebrate Great Union Day, also known as Romania's National Day, the unification of the Romanian provinces into one country which took place at the end of the First World War in 1918. Romanian Canadians make up an essential part of our national character. In fact, Canada is home to over 250,000 Romanian Canadians. Speaker, Mississauga is home to close to 4,500 Romanian Canadians who continue to contribute to the cultural, social and economic fa fabric of Mississauga and of Ontario. Canada would not be the same without athletes like Bianca Andrescu or politicians like Andrew Scheer. Mississauga's own Bianca Andrescu, who is a proud Romanian Canadian, is the highest-ranked Canadian in the history of Women's Tennis Association. Speaker, Romania today is a historically mature country whose binder has passed the test of time. Canada has excellent relations with Romania, as evident by the strong political ties highlighted by shared membership in NATO and La Francophonie. Today, I am very happy to welcome Ms. Oana Raluca Gorghi, the Consul General of Romania, Mr. Florentin Titov Gorghi, Consul, and my dear friend Raul Dudnik from Omni TV to the Legislative Assembly of Ontario. I would like to take a moment to wish them and all of our Romanian Canadian friends a happy Romania National Day here in Ontario as well as worldwide. Merci. Thank you very much. Member statements. The member for Guelph. Here, I'm honoured to rise today to highlight the amazing people-powered organizing that is taking place all across this province right now. Last weekend, I participated in a day of action with hundreds of people knocking on doors from Thunder Bay to Windsor to Ottawa and cities in between, speaking with neighbours to talk about how vital it is to protect the farmland that feeds us the nature that protects us, and calling on the Premier to keep his promise not to open the Greenbelt for development. In a few hours, people collected nearly 4,000 petition signatures and identified hundreds of sign locations, calling on the Premier to keep his Greenbelt promise. Speaker, this weekend there will be rallies again all over the province. Organizers like Environmental Defence, GASP, Water Watchers and Stop the Sprawl are mobilizing to defend the Greenbelt, calling on the Premier to keep your hands off our Greenbelt and to keep his Greenbelt promise, because we know people power works. Speaker, a healthy democracy requires citizen engagement and mobilization, and I'm inspired by the people taking the time out of their busy lives to demand that the government maintain the integrity of the Greenbelt. I will be there this weekend with people defending the green belt and calling on the premier to keep his promise speaker. Thank you very much. <laughs> Member statements. Member for Markham Unionville. Thank you Mr. Speaker. As 2022 is coming to an end, I would like to revisit our recent Markham Unionville funding announcements to wrap up the year on a generous and best towing pitch. 
For foremost, I would like to recap that November 17th marked the 40th anniversary of Ontario Trillium Foundation. Partnering with the Ministry of Tourism, Culture and Sport, I thank OTF for awarding funds to those in need and facilitating culture and sport events in Ontario. I look forward to engaging more in person recognition in the future. Ontario Arts Council's OAC operating grant continues to help enrich our culture lives by supporting the display of some wonderful collections by Canadian artists at our gallery in Markham Unionville. Senior Community Grant from the Minister of Seniors and Accessibility is another great program. Mr. Speaker, this year, Markham Unionville has four recipients. It's great to see senior clubs reconnect and keep their members active again in Markham Unionville. Ontario's health and safety is the top of our government's agenda. Earlier in November, through Health Infrastructure Renewal Fund and Community Infrastructure Renewal Fund, Markham Stouffville Hospital and Hong Fook Mental Health Markham Branch have received respective funding that allows them to provide quality care to their patients. Funding is an important tool for us to work well with our community members. My congratulations here to all successful applicants. Thank you. Thank you. Member Statements, the member for Brantford Brant. Thank you, Speaker. Our government is building a strong, secure food supply chain and securing Ontario's position as a food leader in Canada by releasing our Grow Ontario strategy. The strategy outlines the province's plan to strengthen the agri-food sector, ensure an efficient, reliable and responsive food supply, and address ongoing vulnerabilities through new innovations by focusing on three priorities by strengthening the agri-food supply chain stability, increasing agri-food technology and adoption, and attracting and growing Ontario's agri-food talent. This is particularly important in my home riding of Brantford Brant, Speaker, as agriculture is our single largest economic sector. This plan is a bold vision of pride and trust in the quality and quantity of food produced in Ontario, grown on the foundation of a competitive agri-food industry that serves the needs of Ontarians, Canadians, and the world. That being said, today in the gallery, I would like to welcome the Paris Fair Ambassador, Bronwyn Monkhouse, and the Burford Fair Ambassador, Doug Archer, and, their, and his parents, Scott and Elizabeth. They support, supported and advocated with distinction the Brantford Brant agricultural sector, farmers and food processors that feed us all. Many of us remember the gaps in grocery store shelves on and off during the pandemic. These young people who act as ambassadors for the agricultural sector remind us that food does not magically appear on grocery store shelves, but rather our food is planted, cultivated, raised and processed by some of the best farmers in the world right here in Ontario. And remember this, farmers make up less than 1% of the population, but 100% of us eat. Thank you, Speaker. Before I invite members to introduce their guests, I beg to inform the House that, pursuant to Standing Order 9H, the Clerk has received written notice from the Government House Leader indicating that a temporary change in the weekly meeting schedule of the House is required, and therefore the House shall commence at 9 a.m. on Monday, December 5, 2022, for the proceeding of Orders of the Day. 